Hello, game seller. I'm going into battle, and I want your strongest strategy game. My strategy games are too expensive for you, Traveller. You best go elsewhere. And check out Crusader Kings 3, Paradox's latest role-playing strategy game, now available on Xbox Game Pass for PC. If you'd like to know how to play CK3 and over a hundred other great PC games for one dollar for your first month, and also watch me play CK3, then stick around to the end of the video. Hello and welcome to Feature Fittings, our second entry in the two-year-old series. Hope I didn't keep you waiting too long, but oh boy, is period-specific clothing expensive. What period is that? Well, if you had some damn patience, I'll tell you. Because it just so happens we're going to the 15th century, a time that featured knights in shining armor, mounted warriors from a background of nobility, trained diligently in traditional weaponry and ideals of chivalry. It was truly an inspiring role in society held by a select few. And it's not what we're talking about today. Instead, I've gone and drabbed myself in the cloth and armour of a bohemian peasant, specifically a Hussite gunner. It's crude, it's basic, but it worked at the time. To give a basic explanation of what a Hussite is, they were at their core followers of Jean Hus and his proposed reformations for the Catholic Church. An early Protestant Reformation, if you will. Given the series of wars from 1419 to 1434, Hussites began to be associated most heavily with the armed militias that fought against Catholic Crusaders. The soldiers of these militias came from many walks of life, the bulk of which were untrained peasants. And the funny thing was, these militias became one of the most fearsome and unbeatable armies of the 15th century. It's with great credit to the General Shanchiska and his innovative Wagenberg tactics that untrained peasants became trained in a new way of war, one that did not rely on knights and their steeds, but instead on new tactics and technology. For a synopsis on the wars, I have a whole video on that, but for a better understanding on the method of war, I think it'd be best to look into the individual soldiers themselves, as their signature equipment tells the story of their unique way of war. To strip past the more conspicuous pieces and accessories, a Hussite would really just wear their day-to-day -day garb. What I'm wearing here would suggest that I'm decently well off, the leather shoes, a woolen chaperon, but nothing that stretched to that of full-fledged nobility. Hussites were of many disparate backgrounds. They brought in clergymen, former soldiers, petty nobles, and many, many peasants. The Hussites were not, however, given the support of any sort of monarch so the armour and weapons accessible to them was quite limited. The pieces they could acquire came generally from what could be scavenged on battlefields or looted castle armouries, meaning that the appearance of any made-to-fit plate armour was incredibly unlikely. Many Hussites would go unarmoured and use improvised weapons such as flails or scythes, especially early in the wars. However, for those that could afford it, soft armour was a definite go-to. Body and head armours such as gambeson and padded coice were priorities. Soft armours, despite what they might seem, are very effective and certainly affordable armours, resilient to most blunt force attacks. As the wars continued, these armours were a typical find on Hussites. The next obvious piece to add would be a helmet. Bassinet helmets were commonly available, and another popular Central European helmet, the Kettle helmet, appeared in many variant forms. Male coifs and shirts could also appear, and sometimes, though scarcely, you could see plate gauntlets and greaves. Anything more complex than these pieces would be pretty much limited to the handful of mounted knights that fought alongside the Hussites. Hussite arms followed pretty much the same trend as their armour. When it came to melee, beyond improvised flails, scythes, and the occasional proper polearm, Hussites would have only carried a simple dagger, maybe a messer sword, a knife-like sword carried by civilians for self-defence, However, just about all of these pieces a Hussite could have had would have been considered a nice-to-have and not a need-to-have. The war tactics of the Hussites did not rely strongly on any individual's attack and defence, but instead the protection of the unit. This is best demonstrated with the Hussites' iconic paver's shields. These gigantic and bloody unwieldy shields would be deployed on the ground as part of Wagenberg formation. 
and used to protect several men as they would reload their crossbows and hand cannons. The Hussites' way of war prioritised defence. Their converted war wagons would be used as mobile forts, able to be deployed anywhere where the terrain favoured them. Artillery could be housed within and on the wagons, and a focus on long arse and ranged arse weaponry, and the Hussites themselves rarely had to leave the cover of their wagons and shields. Many of these ranged weapons would be traditional crossbows or large howitzers, but one of the real eye catches of Hussite weaponry has to be the Pishtala. The Pishtala or hand cannon was at the time an uncommon and unfamiliar weapon. The hand cannons were technically handheld, but shooting them from an unsupported position was just about impossible, and accuracy, well, that was non existent. Instead, the firearms didn't find much use in landing shots but instead the blinding smoke and ear-piercing sound they blasted terrified knights and most importantly, their loyal steeds. Wagenberg dragged the enemy crusaders into a position that already disadvantaged them and with an added mix of disorientation and fear, the knights would be left dismounted and vulnerable to the conventional crossbows, polearms, scythes and flails brandished by the Hussites. Hussites were not successful because of their weaponry and there was nothing revolutionary about their armour. It really came down to innovative tactics that they were able to always have a step over their traditional opponents. Untrained peasants weren't burdened by preconceptions of what war was, and it was under the command of generals like Jan Shiska that they were able to dictate what war is. Common people can never expect to win by playing by the rules of their betters. It's on the innovative and imaginative thinkers among us to create new rules, create a new way of doing things that makes them the superior. And if there's any lesson to draw from this video, I think that's a pretty nifty one. Sucking at Crusader Kings 2? Well, what if I told you there's a Crusader Kings 3? Would you like to know how to play it now? For as low as $1 for your first month? Well, let me tell you about Xbox Game Pass for PC. With the Xbox Game Pass, you can get access to over 100 high-quality PC games, including releases like the Halo Master Chief Collection, Microsoft Flight Simulator, and of course, every history connoisseur's favourite, Crusader Kings 3. In Paradox's latest role-playing grand strategy game, you can explore and exploit a map that stretches from Iceland to India, to the Arctic Circle, and even down to Central Africa. The game covers from the 9th century to the 15th century, so you've got hundreds of years to delve into the game's features. You pick your character, and you play your dynasty, developing your domain, marrying your siblings, waging epic wars, and assassinating pesky children. You can see me and Simo doing all that over on his channel where we did a 30 minute playthrough of the game together. Really, Crusader Kings 3 is a game you can easily sink hundreds of hours into. I've already played it for days mate. So with CK3 and tons more of your favourite games on offer with Xbox Game Pass, what are you waiting for? The end card of the video? No 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 no. Check out the link on screen or in the description, say goodbye to your friends and family, make sure your pets are fed, lock the door and get into some Crusader Kings 3. I'd like to thank the sponsor, thank the patrons, and especially thank everyone for their patience with this video. It was a big project with a lot of cock-ups, but now it's here, and I hope you enjoyed it. For our next video, we'll be delving into some juicy 19th century Asian history, so keep an eye out for that. I guarantee it'll be here before at least 2030. So bye-bye now.